Hello, and welcome to Spotlight on Asian Pacific Americans. Today, we will be exploring the life and legacy of Larry Itliang, a Filipino American labor leader who organized West Coast agricultural workers. Larry Itliang was born in 1913 in the Philippines. He was an American labor organizer who organized West Coast farmers starting in the 1930s. He rose to national fame in 1965 when he and his fellow farm workers walked off the farms of area grape growers, demanding wages equal to the federal minimum wage. That became known as the Delano Grape Strike. He has been described as one of the fathers of the West Coast labor movement and is regarded as a key figure of the Asian American movement. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about the Asia Pacific region. Asia is the largest continent of our planet, both in size and in population. More than 4.6 billion people live on the continent of Asia that includes 48 countries. An Asian Pacific American is an American that is of Asian or Pacific Islander descent. People may choose to use this term to identify themselves, but not every Asian American does. According to the 2019 Census Population Estimate, there are 18.9 million Asian Americans living in the United States. Asian Americans account for 5.7% of the nation's population. Larry Itliang was a Filipino-American. He was born in the Philippines, but immigrated to the United States when he was 15 years old. The Philippines is a Southeast Asia island country in the Western Pacific Ocean. An island country is a country made up of one or more islands and surrounded by water. The Philippines consists of more than 7,000 islands and is one of the largest island countries in the world. As a result, it is divided into three island groups, Luzon, the Visayas, and Mindanoa. The capital of the Philippines is Manila. For four centuries, Manila has been the main city for development and trade. Looking at the map, what are some of the Philippines' closest neighbors? Before we continue, let's do a little pre-work. You may hear the word union a lot during this presentation, so it's important to explore the concept. Let's consider this question. What is a union anyway? Watch this brief video developed by the Pennsylvania American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organ Organizations to learn more. The Pennsylvania AFL-CIO presents a brief history of unions. <laughs> A long time ago, when our great country was just being built, there were the haves <laughs> money, money, money. and the have-nots. <sighs> the haves owned companies and industries, and they relied on their workers to, well, do the hard work. The workers were proud of what they did. They worked hard every day. But they watched the companies and the haves get richer and richer while they got poorer or stayed the same. They had to work for as long as their bosses told them to work. They didn't get overtime pay. They didn't get to take a break. And there was no guarantee they would be safe at work. If they got hurt or even killed, the company didn't have to do anything about it. This isn't fair! The workers decided to do something about it. But it was hard. The companies could just fire them. They're lost. So the workers joined in unity. Together, they had a voice. Together, they could demand things like fair wage, safe working conditions, an end to child labor, sick leave, family leave, pensions. Together, labor unions created something in between the haves and the have-nots, the middle class. The middle class is very important. It allows people to make better lives for themselves. And the middle class has money to spend. And when they buy things, that money goes back into our economy. And it makes America strong. Now let's learn a little more about Larry Itliang by reading Journey for Justice, The Life of Larry Itliang. 
written by Don R. Mabalone, Ph.D., with Gail Romosanta, illustrated by Andre Sibian. The Center for Global Education has received permission for this reading from the publisher. We will provide an abridged version of the story to accommodate for time. Modesto Dulé Itlion was born on October 25, 1913, to Francisca and Artemio Itlion. Modesto, who was given the nickname Larry, was born in the Philippines, in a village called San Nicolas. He was born during typhoon season, a time of heavy rains and wind. San Nicolas was a small but beautiful town surrounded by rice fields, coconut and palm trees, green mountains, rivers and waterfalls. The village was in Pagasinan province, another word for region. On the island of Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines, a nation in the Pacific Ocean made up of more than 7,641 islands. Larry spent his childhood playing and working with his three brothers and two sisters. He loved to play baseball. All the villagers knew Larry to be funny, confident, and friendly. Like many others in San Nicolas, Larry's parents were poor farmers who had little education. There wasn't even a high school in the village. Larry only attended school until the sixth grade. At the time, the Philippines was a colony of the United States and the U.S. controlled the island nation's schools, government, military, and economy. All schools were taught in English, and if Larry tried to speak in Ilocano, the language he spoke at home, the teachers punished him by hitting his hand with a ruler or worse. Larry's teachers praised the United States as the best, most beautiful, and modern country in the world. Larry and his friends dreamed of going to America to see it with their own eyes. Larry's neighbor was one of the thousands of workers who left the Philippines to work in the sugar plantations and farms of Hawaii and the United States. These farms and plantations needed laborers and Filipinos traveled to the U.S. to work and study. The neighbor wrote letters to Larry to brag about his adventures. Schools are good here, Larry's neighbor wrote. You can finish high school and college very quickly. Larry liked the sound of that. In school, Larry learned about abogados, attorneys also called lawyers, who helped people with their problems. Some lawyers were rich and powerful people who represented his province in the Philippines legislature. Larry imagined himself debating with others and helping poor people. I want to be like that, he thought. He imagined himself with a briefcase, wearing a suit and a beautiful wool fedora, just like he saw in the photos that his neighbor and villager sent from the United States. He could study to become a lawyer in the U.S. In his American textbooks, Larry read that everyone had equal opportunities for success in America. When Larry was 15, he decided he was going to make his dreams come true. He told his father he was going to the United States. Why do you want to go to America? Larry's father asked. I want to go to school, Larry said. But his father did not want him to leave. You don't have my permission to go, he said. But Larry was stubborn, and he had made up his mind. I'm going anyway, he insisted. I will find the money to get there. Larry found some neighborhood boys playing a coin game. Unfortunately, all Larry had in his pocket was his allowance, five pesos from his mother. Creating his own luck, he bet his entire allowance on the game and won 5,000 pesos and 12 acres of land. His father was angry that Larry had been gambling, but he knew the money that Larry won could help the family. Why don't you build the family a new house, his father suggested. But my dream is to go to America, Larry said. Larry's father was disappointed, but he finally gave his permission for Larry to leave. Before Larry left, he visited his very good friend, a classmate he liked, and told her he was leaving for America. She burst into tears. All the boys in the village are leaving to study and work in America. I want to go too, but my papa won't let me travel so far alone, she exclaimed. My papa didn't want me to go either, but I told him I'm going to school. I'll be back in a few years as a lawyer and we can get married, Larry said. That means when you're back, we'll both have our college educations. I'm going to college in Manila so I can be a teacher, she exclaimed. You mean it, Larry? You'll come back, she asked. Larry nodded. I'll be back, he promised. Until then, I'll write you letters. They looked at each other with hope. 
Larry said the rest of his goodbyes to his family and friends in San Nicolas and went to Manila, where he bought a ticket to travel on the steamship Empress of Asia. All the money he had in the world, $50, he put deep in his pocket for safekeeping. He boarded the ship with hundreds of other young Filipinas and Filipinos. He quickly, quickly realized that at age 15, he was the youngest passenger on the entire ship. He found some older boys from San Nicolas, and they talked far into the night. Would they see snow in tall buildings? Would they find gold coins on the ground like the teachers had told them? What would they study in college? During the day, they went up on the ship's deck and met fellow passengers from all over the Philippines. Everyone was bursting with happiness and anticipation. I'm going to be a lawyer, Larry bragged. I'm going to Columbia University in New York City to become a nurse, like my cousin, one Filipino woman said. She showed everyone the creased photo of her smiling cousin. The trip took 22 days. When Larry landed in Seattle, Washington, it was gray, drizzly, and cold. He had never felt such chilly air before. He gazed with wonder at the buildings surrounded by mountains, trees, and snow-topped Mount Rainer. One of his uncles lived in Seattle and met him at the pier. After two weeks in Seattle, Larry heard that a farmer in Montana needed workers to harvest sugar beets. He said goodbye to his uncle and hopped on a train to Montana. Then, Larry woke before dawn and worked with the crew of Filipinos who hunched over the land for hours under a relentless sun during the day and in freezing wind at night. They worked with no breaks, toilets, or clean drinking water, and they slept in old barns and dusty bunkhouses with dirt floors. Larry's back and knees ached, and his sore muscles made him toss and turn at night. He had to wear a wide-brimmed hat, long sleeves, and boots for protection from the sun and dust. He sometimes worked 12 hours or more a day and had no days off. The farmers also used poisonous chemicals called pesticides on the crops to kill the insects that damaged the crops but the pesticides also hurt the workers. After the lettuce season was over, Larry found a job working on the railroad in Montana. One day, while he was riding the train, he realized that he missed his stop. With the train going full speed, Larry jumped off, put his right pinky finger, but his right pinky finger got caught in the train door. He lost a lot of blood and stayed in the hospital for three months. His fingers were so damaged that the doctor had to amputate or surgically remove three fingers on his right hand. After Larry healed, his friends in the United States gave him a new nickname, Seven Fingers. He knew they were only teasing him, and he thought it was funny. He wrote a letter to his family about the accident, and he looked for a new job. Larry's father wrote back and suggested that he could go to college in Manila and live with an uncle there. Larry wondered, what his former classmates would think of him. He left for America with big hopes, only to come home with nothing. Even worse, he would return with three fewer fingers. Larry wrote back right away, No, I came here on my own free will. And if I can't lick this problem by myself, then I am nobody, he wrote. When it seemed that life could not get any worse for Larry and his friends, the U.S. Congress passed two laws. One right after the other aimed at Filipinos. One law barred almost all Filipino immigrants from entering the United States. The other law, called the Reparation Act, offered Filipinos a one-way ticket home to the Philippines, but they could never return. Only about 2,000 Filipinos took that, those tickets. Feeling disappointed and defeated, they packed their bags, wore their best clothes, and boarded ships at the ports of San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seattle. Larry had a decision to make. Should he take the free ticket and go back to San Nicolas? He closed his eyes and imagined the waterfalls and green mountains of his quiet village. He thought of his parents and his childhood sweetheart. Larry began to write a letter to his childhood friend. I'm sorry, but I'm not coming home, he wrote. His heart felt heavy as he explained that he had a new dream. He was staying in America. He wanted to be a labor organizer, someone who inspired his fellow workers to join together into a union the fights for their rights. Larry wasn't sure if he would ever become a lawyer, but he could still help people get justice. He was going to stay. Now let's take a brief break from the story to watch this exciting music video by Filipino-American musical artist A.J. Raphael. 
The song is called Our Friend Larry Leong and it was developed in partnership with Theatre Works USA. When our history finally makes it on the page There's something missing that our schools just don't say So maybe it's time that we put our story right where it rightfully belongs Let's learn some more about our friend Larry Ilion Larry was an immigrant man He left the Philippines for the American dream And came here to study law At least that was his goal But then reality hit Couldn't afford the toll So he became a farm worker Working in Alaska, Washington, and in California He lost three fingers from working so hard He was called Seven, seven fingers. fingers from that point on ha. But before we get into what he did You gotta learn what a strike in a union is A union is an organized group of workers And a strike is when those workers protest their employers. So Larry got the Filipinos in the unions to stand up for fair wages and good working conditions. He started a strike and I'll tell you why it matters. So let's turn the page to the very first chapter. What happens when our history finally makes it on the page? There's something missing that the schools just don't say. So here we are telling the story of a man who knew right Let's learn some more about our friend Larry Ilion. Modesto was nicknamed Larry by his dad and his mom. He was born in the Philippines in Pangasinan. Since he was little, wanted to go to America. A briefcase, nice suit, and beautiful fedora. He turned 15 and made his dreams come true. He didn't have his dad's permission, but he still went through. Gambled all his savings for a ship that left Manila with only $50. He dreamt of becoming a lawyer. Arrived in Seattle, met the other Filipinos. They all gave up their dreams to survive, so now he knows realities are coming to the country of your dreams. It was definitely harder than it seemed. So he became a farm worker all over the state. He noticed that Filipinos were not getting fairly paid. He joined his fellow farm workers to fight for what was right. Let's fast forward to the Delano Grape Strike. What happens when this grape strike finally makes it on the page? Larry is missing from the history stage. So maybe it's time that we put his story right where it rightfully belongs. Let's learn about the legacy of Larry Ilion. So when Larry was in Stockton, he learned about AWOC, a union Larry helped recruit for in the Central Valley. He met Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, who worked with Mexicans. Delano also dealing with low wages. Larry's friend Ben said, We have to go on strike. Larry agreed, but it didn't happen overnight. All of the Filipinos gathered in Filipino Hall. They needed all of their support, not from one, but from all. The legend's true. All Larry had to say was, I want those in favor to stand up with your hand raised. The crowd is silent. Will they take a stand? After a moment, everybody raise a right hand. This is what they waited for. So, with all their might, over 2,000 members were going on strike. Farmers left the fields and the growers were mad. They beat them up, shut the power off. Yo, it was bad. Larry knew they needed solidarity with the Mexicans and Cesar Chavez. Unity! If they worked together, they could win the strike. Cesar Chavez said yes, and for the first time, Mexicans and Filipinos went even further to join two unions that united farm workers. They traveled up and down California, telling all the stores to stop carrying grapes from Delano. This lasted five years, it was hard, and in 1970, the growers finally gave in to the demands justice prevailed and Larry led the way and that's why we have Larry Ilion Day a song box what happens when our Larry finally makes it on the page? It's something missing that the schools just don't say. So maybe it's time that we tell this story through more than just this song. Let's celebrate our friend and modern Larry Ilion. Let's get back to our story. 
Workers all over the West Coast were forming unions and striking for better wages and working conditions. The cannery and farm owners were powerful, and they had sheriffs, police, judges, and officials on their side. Strikes were crushed because of beatings, arrests, and many union workers and members had to stop striking. One day in 1959, Larry spotted his friend, Rudy Delvo, on El Dorado Street in Stockton's Little Manila. Larry, I just got a new job with the new farm labor union, Rudy exclaimed. I think this is the union that will finally bring us justice. Come and work with us as an organizer. Tell me more, Larry said. Rudy took him to the union office near Little Manila and told him all about the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, or the AWOC. It had support from a powerful national union, the American Federation of Labor Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO. At first, Larry was hesitant. We've heard that everybody depends on you, Larry, one of the union bosses told him. You do a lot of good things for the Filipinos. Larry thought it over and agreed to join the union as an organizer. In May of 1965, the Filipino grape workers in Coachella Valley in the southern tip of California near Mexico were angry. The farmers were paying some workers $1.40 an hour, but only giving the Filipino workers $1.25 an hour. Ben Gines called Larry. We have to go on strike, Ben insisted. Larry agreed. The AWOC workers demanded $1.40 per hour and 25 cents a box of grapes from the growers in Coachella Valley. The police arrested many of the strikers. Because they were united and the farmers were desperate for workers, the growers gave them what they demanded after 10 days of the strike. The workers finished the harvest and then went north to Delano, where the grapes were sweet and heavy on the, on the vine. It was time for the harvest. When the workers arrived in Delano, the grape growers refused to give them the same wage. On September 7, 1965, Larry invited hundreds of AWOC members and all the growers to meet at the Filipino Hall in Delano to negotiate. But the growers didn't show up. Larry and AWOC union leaders such as Ben Gines, Pete Manuel, and Pete Velasco led the discussion in the crowded hall. They spoke in many different Filipino languages, like Ilocano, Visayan, Tagalog, and also in English, so everyone could understand. Not all, all, not all the AWOC members were Filipino. Some were African American, Arab, Puerto Rican, Mexican, and some were white. But what about my wife and children? We might go hungry, a Filipino worker argued. One elderly Filipino stood up. We're not going to get any younger, he shouted. This might be our last chance to win a good wage and the right to form a union. Many nodded their heads. Bob Armington, a leader in the community, raised his hand. I move that we vote to go on strike, he said. The crowd went silent. Larry called out. I want those in favor to stand up with your hand raised. Everyone stood up and raised their right hand in the air. It was unanimous. They were going on strike. day, September 8th, the Great Delano Grape Strike began. More than 2,000 members of the AWOC walked off the grape vineyards, leaving the grapes hanging on the vine and yelling, Welga Strike. Their demand was simple, $1.40 per hour, 25 cents a box, and the right to form a union. The workers walked around the vineyards across Delano, shouting and holding signs. Larry had an idea. He knew that justice for farm workers could be realized if the two biggest groups of farm workers, Filipinos and Mexicans, could unite. For many decades, he saw that the growers made sure Filipinos and Mexicans lived in separate camps and were paid different wages so that they would always fight each other instead of the growers. He knew that if the two communities stood together in unity, they would be even stronger. They might even win. Larry knew what he had to do. In Delano, Cesar Chavez, Gilbert Padilla, and Dolores Huerta were building the membership of the National Farm Workers Association, 
which was made up of mostly Mexican Americans. Larry went to see Cesar and asked Cesar and the NFWA to join the Filipinos on strike. The next year, the two unions became one. They formed the United Farm Workers, also known as the UFW, with Cesar Chavez as the director and Larry Leong as the assistant director. The pressure worked. In 1970, more than 30 grape growers in Delano met with the UFW and agreed to pay in- to a pay increase, a medical insurance plan, and control over toxic pesticides. This was a significant victory for the union and the workers. Farmers union members and the press gathered at the UFW headquarters, 40 acres, to sign the contracts. As Larry signed the new contracts, his fingers felt the rush of his signature and the enormity of the moment. He knew what this meant for his people and all farm workers. For his entire life, he worked to create a union for farm workers. He and his fellow workers had walked a long journey for justice and stayed their course. He had fulfilled his dream from so, for so long. He did it. They did it. Born in a small village to poor farmers, Larry, a boy without money or power, but with big dreams, helped to change the world by fighting for justice. He spent his life helping poor people and workers, led the great Delano grape strike, and became a leader in the farm workers movement, one of the greatest social movements in American history. Like his name implies, Modesto Dulé Larry Itlion was a modest man, but he was a force who believed deep in his heart that all people should have justice. And he was so passionate that he dedicated every day of his life to this dream. I hope you enjoyed the story and were able to learn a little more about Larry Itliong. Now let's take a look at the activity sheet in front of you. It's okay if you don't have it, just follow along on the screen. We are going to go through all the different ways that Larry showed us that he was a global citizen. You may follow along or take notes on your activity sheet as we go through how he was able to investigate the world, recognize perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action during his lifetime. Let's start with how Larry took opportunities to investigate the world. Do you remember when Larry spoke to his friend so passionately about going to America? He was determined to learn more about the world and take any risks to make a better life for himself. He wanted to study, become a lawyer, and bring back his new skills to make the Philippines a better place. How about recognized perspectives? Larry had the great idea to join forces with the Mexican farmers. He knew that learning about their perspectives was only going to make their movement stronger. By listening carefully and taking the time to understand other people, Larry was able to reach his goal and create better conditions for farm workers everywhere. When it came time to communicate ideas, Larry was a pro. Larry was able to gather workers from all over California to meet in Delano. He spoke passionately about the need for the farm workers to organize and stick together so that conditions for everyone could improve. He was able to communicate to people from all types of backgrounds and experiences, and eventually the workers went on strike and were able to reach their goal. Finally, there were many ways that Larry took action to help others. After five long years of the grape strike, Larry's actions saw real results. He and his fellow workers had walked a long journey for justice and stayed their course. He had fulfilled his dream from long ago and was able to make real lasting change. His actions are still regarded as an important step in farm workers' rights in the United States. Salamat, or thank you. We hope you enjoyed our session today as we explored the life and legacy of Larry Itliong.
join us next week as we explore the life and work of Kalpana Chawla, Indian American astronaut, engineer, and the first woman of Asian origin to go to space. Thank you for joining us today for Spotlight on Asian Pacific Americans, and we will see you next time.